Jewish Channel's Week in Review. A baker's dozen of Jewish billionaires steps up to the plate. A klezmer band channels Arlo Guthrie, sitting down with the youngest Jewish member of Congress, and the NBA's very Jewish summer. It's the Jewish news that's changing your world on this episode of the Week in Review. Hello, and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. It's perhaps the largest giving campaign in world history, with moguls Warren Buffett and Bill Gates leading the charge, and they've recruited 13 Jewish billionaires to their cause. Buffett and Gates are calling for billionaires to donate more than half their wealth to philanthropic causes during their lifetimes, in what they're calling the Giving Pledge. Forty billionaires have signed on so far, and 13 of them are Jewish. They include New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg, media titan Barry Diller, Oracle founder Larry Ellison, and Home Depot founder Bernie Marcus. According to Forbes, Ellison is the wealthiest Jewish billionaire in the world, with a net worth of $28 billion. The two next wealthiest Jews to join the Giving Pledge, Bloomberg and Eli Broad, represent $18 and $5.7 billion in net worth, respectively, according to Forbes. With the rest of the 13 Jewish pledgers worth between $1 and $3 billion, the net worth of Jewish contributions will be more than $30 billion, which is more than 10% of the $230 billion the Giving Pledge has announced so far. But those working at Jewish organizations shouldn't get too excited about these pledges, as most of these philanthropists tend to give relatively small portions of their total donations to Jewish causes. Moving on to someone who tried to change the world in a different way, folk singer Arlo Guthrie was known for his songs of protest in the 1960s and 70s, but not much is known about his Jewish heritage. A klezmer group is helping to bring that story to light, as Rebecca Honig Friedman reports. icon Woody Guthrie is known as a musical warrior, fighting for social justice armed with incisive lyrics in acoustic guitar and a voice full of country twang. So how did Guthrie's lyrics end up in a Grammy-winning Klezmer album? It started when acclaimed Klezmer band The Klezmatics met Guthrie's daughter Nora Guthrie after a concert. She told us this wonderful story about her father's lyrics and how she was trying to find people to write new music to her father's lyrics and she had these Jewish songs and we're going Woody Guthrie, the you know American beat hobo bard. What are you talking about Jewish? Guthrie wasn't Jewish, but his family was. And it turns out he lived in Brooklyn on Coney Island. He had a Jewish wife. His mother-in-law was the great Yiddish poet Eliza Greenblatt and, and he wrote about their life. And so the Klezmatics set his words to new music. We made two CDs, one of them all Woody Guthrie Hanukkah songs called Woody Guthrie's Happy Joyous Hanukkah and the other one is called Wonder Wheel and it's songs about Brooklyn and about New York and about mysticism and making the world a better place. To hear more from the Klezmatics and how the Workman's Circle is using music to spread a Yiddish social justice revival, tune in to the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Rebecca. For this week's Newsmaker segment, I recently sat down with the youngest Jewish member of Congress, Colorado Democrat Jared Polis. We discussed issues regarding Israel and the Jewish community, as well as one other way in which Polis is a rarity in Congress. He's the first openly gay man to be elected to a seat in the House of Representatives, something he feels adds to his advocacy for Israel. Here's that interview. Congressman Polis, thank you very much for joining us. As the first openly gay member elected to Congress and a Jewish congressman, what kind of advocacy are you hoping to see on gay issues in the Jewish community? Well, I think first of all, it's important to talk about you know how Israel is, of course, the only country in the Middle East where you can uh, even you know be gay, and and uh, uh, and they have uh, you know a very uh, high quality of life for gay and lesbian residents in Israel, and uh, you compare that to countries like Iran or or Syria. Uh, where uh, there are, uh, you know, frequently you risk uh, death, you know, if you, uh, if you say you're gay. Uh, Lebanon has become a little bit of the capital of the gay Muslim world, but uh, even in Lebanon it's much more underground than it is in Israel, uh, where it's uh, in some ways more progressive than here. I mean, gays and lesbians have served in the Israeli army as long as, uh, I think, you know, since it started. I mean, so you can't just get out of serving in the army just because you're gay or lesbian. I mean, Israelis don't consider that a valid excuse. Uh, our country's moving in that direction, but we're a little bit slower. On that issue of that line that Israel has been pushing for a few years that it is the only place that you can be gay in the Middle East uh, and they've been hoping to pick up a lot of sympathy with that line and it's not entirely clear whether they have or not. What do you think 
uh, that has achieved? Do you think that they are getting more support from the gay community than they were before? Well, I hope so. I mean, obviously the other big issue is feminism and the equal rights of women. I mean, you wouldn't want to be a, women in, a woman in most places in the Arab world either. I mean, if there's any doubt among anybody in the gay community, they should simply go to you know, a place like even a, a quote-unquote liberal Arab country like Jordan or Egypt. Uh, and Israel and see the difference in how gays and lesbians are treated. Um, I mean, it is, in Egypt they still, uh, they, they raided and closed down a, a gay nightclub a few years ago and there really aren't any that are accepted. I mean, Israel has, uh, as I said, everything from uh, a, a thriving gay scene to broad uh, acceptance of, of gays and lesbians in all facets of life. So it's a, uh, I, you know, if there's any, any uh, gay people who, who doubt uh, who you know, doubt Israel, they should certainly go and learn about that. Thank you very much for joining us. All right, thank you. Finally, for most basketball fans, the month of August carries little interest. With the recent season well behind us and the major free agent signings already having occurred, there's not much to look forward to other than next season. Well, how about looking forward to the next Jewish year? Shaquille O'Neal, who recently signed with the Boston Celtics, was caught wishing just that to gossip site TMZ's Harvey Levin after a night out. Harvey. Uh, what does that mean? That's Harvey. Harvey. Okay. I'm going to say it slow. Tova, Shalom. How about uh, Amari Stoudemire? In the Congratulations, Amari. Israel to uh, find out about his Jewish heritage. Shalom to Amari. <laughs> All right. All right, I'll see you. Take care, man. <laughs> O'Neal also had a shalom for Amari Stoudemire, the power forward recently signed by the New York Knicks, who took a trip to Israel. While there, an inaccurate report claiming he was Jewish led to an explosion of Jewish interest in the basketball star. Stoudemire clarified that in an interview with the Associated Press, saying of his mother, she studied the scriptures and history and she believes she is a Hebrew. Stoudemire is studying Hebrew and exploring the possibility he has Jewish heritage, according to his agent who said, I know there are some reports that he is Jewish, but he is not. He thinks there may be some Jewish blood on his mother's side, and he is researching it. And then there's the biggest NBA star of them all, LeBron James. Perhaps the most gifted athlete in NBA history, James felt he should consult a rabbi for advice in business. He can be seen in this photo holding hands with Rabbi Yeshayahu Yosef Pinto, a rabbi known for consulting on business issues. It's hard to say what brought about this Jewish summer in the NBA, but it's possible that at least two of the examples have one source. LeBron James and Shaquille O'Neal were teammates this past season on the Cleveland Cavaliers, with both sadly leaving town and taking Cleveland's hopes for a title with them. But James, born and bred in Ohio, apparently got friendly with some Jewish leaders in the area, as when he was asked last year to nominate someone for Time Magazine's list of the world's most influential people, James nominated Jay Schottenstein, an Ohio businessman and philanthropist who sponsored Art Scroll's translation of the Talmud. That's all for this week. For more news and analysis from the Jewish Channel during the week, please check out our blog at newsdesk.tjctv.com. From all of us here at the Jewish Channel, be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. IO Optimum Cable Channel 291, Time Warner Cable Channel 528, RCN Channel 268, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and Cox Cable Channel 1. For more information, visit tjctv.com.